Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I'm going to walk you through the process of valuing pay safe stock so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 744 million market cap. They're trading at $12 a share and they have 62 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So their free cash flow looked really good in 2020, 2021, and 2022. They did have a big negative in the trailing 12 months. We'll dig into their financial statements in a little bit. Maybe we can figure that out. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's negative each year. A big negative in 2022. I'm sure that's an asset impairment. Probably like a goodwill impairment. Because they had positive free cash flow that year. Revenue is the sales for the company. And that's pretty much flat. It is up a little bit in the trailing 12 months to 1.6 billion, but not up too much. That's probably a big reason the stock price is declining because their revenue is not increasing. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which saw cash flows past year four, that's 3.7 billion. We discounted the numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $2.1 billion. We divide that by 744 million shares and we get a calculated stock price of $34. They're trading at $12. So they're trading at a 65% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. The stock has come down a ton since they IPO'd. This started out as a SPAC. We're going to look at their stock chart in a little bit. It seems like they're getting close to the point of profitability. And if they get there, even if they have a small profit, they should be worth a lot more than $744 million. That's a pretty small market cap. This is the third video I did on PaySafe. The first one was in August 2021. My stock price was $644. Then in January 2022, my stock price was $424. Now it's $34. But $34 is not higher than these two numbers. I know 34 is higher than $4, but you have to look at the market cap. I went from 4.7 billion, that was my valuation for the company, to 3 billion, now it's 2.1 billion. So my valuation has gone down. The reason the stock price is so much higher than the past is because they did a reverse stock split. Look at shares outstanding, 724 million. It's still 724 million in January 2022. Then they did a one for 12 reverse stock split and that brought their shares down to 62 million. So you're spreading this number, the 2.1 billion over less shares. That's why it's so much higher 34 than four. Stock splits and reverse stock splits are a pretty simple concept, but they can be confusing. Don't make the mistake of looking at a stock chart and thinking a stock was $100 in the past and now it's $2 today, so you buy it thinking if it just goes back to $100. It never was $100. It probably peaked at like $5 or $10. The reason it looks like it was $100 is reverse stock splits. I'll show you this stock chart in a little bit in Yahoo Finance and it'll make more sense. There are 129 companies in the same industry as PaySafe and if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. So they don't spend that much in CapEx, 100 million. Software companies generally don't spend much in CapEx. Microsoft does because they do manufacturing as well. They make things like computers. And when companies make things, they manufacture things, they have to spend a lot in CapEx. Because when you buy a factory and equipment and machinery, that all gets put into CapEx and put into your balance sheet and depreciate it over its useful life. They're a bit leveraged, 2.9 debt to equity ratio. So for every dollar of equity, they have $2.90 of debt. The average is 1.8, median is 0.6. Most companies in this industry do not pay a dividend. Everybody generates positive free cash flow except them. They rank 76th in market cap of the 129 companies. They have an amazing price to book, it's below one. That means the company's worth more in bankruptcy than as an operating entity. We can't look at their PE, they have negative earnings. We can't look at the price to free cash flow, they have negative free cash flow. Amazing price to sales, 0 0.5. When it's 0 0.5, that means their revenue is double their market cap. It's actually a little more than double. So it's probably like 0 0.47 or something like that. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share or market cap over annual revenue. They generate more revenue than the median, less than the average. They generate more revenue than some of these top 20 companies. 
They generate a little more than Path and a lot more than Samsara. They have not been public for five years, so we can't look at their annual revenue growth rate, but it's probably pretty flat over the past five years, hovering around 0%. Let's dig into their financials. We'll start with their income statement. For the three months ending 9-30-2023, revenue of $396 million. That's up from the same period in 2022, $366 million. And for the trailing nine months, it's $1.2 billion, up from $1.1 billion. So that's good. Their revenue is up a little bit, about 10%. Well, at least the third quarter is up about 10%. Let's see if we get more backup for this number, the $396 million. So here's a breakdown of their revenue. $217 million merchant solutions. 183 million digital wallets. And their EBITDA is much higher in digital wallets, 80 million. Merchant Solutions, 60 million. So much better margins. So for the third quarter of 2023, their total volume was 35 billion. For the first nine months of 2023, 104 billion. And let's look at 2022 volumes. The third quarter, 32 billion. First three quarters, 97 billion. So volume is up. They generated 396 million of revenue in the third quarter, up from 366 million. We saw that in the income statement. Their payment platform offers credit and debit card processing to digital wallet, e-cash, and real-time banking solutions. So when you pay for things using your debit or credit card, they take a fee. That's how they make money. They have millions of active users in more than 120 countries. That's referring to the digital payment platform. They also provide digital wallet solutions. That includes iGaming, which includes online betting related to sports, esports, fantasy sports, poker, and other casino games. They're one of the biggest players in iGaming. They also transact cryptocurrencies, and they offer merchant solutions for small and medium-sized businesses. So if another company sells goods or services, so let's say that company's customer pays with a debit card or credit card. We'll call them Company X. So Company X will use PaySafe's digital platform. Lots of companies offer merchant solutions. So if you have a small business or an online business or any type of business, you need a merchant provider so people can pay via credit card. And PaySafe is one of the many, many merchant providers. So revenue increased 8.3% from third quarter 2023 versus third quarter 2022. That's an increase of 30.4 million and 13 million of that increase is Merchant Solutions because they had higher volumes in that area and 20 million in their digital wallet segment. That's due to growth initiatives, also favorable foreign exchange and higher interest income. Let's go back to the income statement. All the expenses directly tied to generating the 396 million is 164 million. Then you have SGNA marketing as part of SGNA 121 million. That's down from last year, but cost of revenue is up. Depreciation and amortization is 67 million. It looks like a lot of the amortization is from intangible assets. There are lots of intangible assets like Goodwill, although Goodwill is not amortized. It's the only intangible asset that's not amortized. It's tested annually for impairment. When you acquire another company, that's how you get intangibles on your balance sheet. It could be related to computer software, licenses, trademarks, patents, etc. Their operating income went up a lot. It was only 4.7 million in 2022, and now it's 43 million. That's a really impressive growth. And the reason they had a big negative in 2022 was this 1.9 billion impairment. So they've acquired a bunch of companies in the past and they had goodwill in their balance sheet. And they say due to a sustained decline in stock price and market cap, as well as market and macroeconomic conditions, they passed through a large goodwill impairment in both the merchant solutions and digital wallet segments. That was in 2022, but no goodwill impairments in 2023. Impairments are non-cash items. So it doesn't affect cash flow because when you acquire another company, the cash flow happens at acquisition. So it's already out the door. So when you write down the asset, it doesn't affect cash. You don't lose any cash. Say for instance, you bought an investment property for $100,000 and you paid all cash, for instance. Then five years later, the value of the property was $70,000. So you have to pass through a $30,000 write down or impairment, but you don't lose $30,000. You already spent $100,000 when you originally bought the home. Even if you don't pay cash for the home, say you get a loan, it's still a non-cash item. 
because you did pay for the home originally, probably put down a 20% down payment and the rest you got a loan. So you still owe the same amount on the loan regardless of where the price of the home moves. The price of the home could triple. It's not like you get any money. You still owe the same amount on your loan. If you sell the home, you can get the money. It looks like they had negative net income in the third quarter of 2023 because of 17 million of taxes. Last year it was only 7 million which is why they had positive net income last year and negative this year. They talk about that here. Effective 4-1-2023, the UK statutory tax rate increased from 19% to 25%, and a weighted average of 23.5% has been applied to 2023. The tax rate for the third quarter of 2023 was 117% higher than in 2022. That's due to the impact of the valuation allowance on restricted interest carry forwards. Once again, a valuation allowance is a non-cash item, so it doesn't affect cash flow. That's due to higher interest rates, so they have a higher valuation allowance. Let's take a look at that balance sheet. This is 9-30-2023, 12-31-2022. So their current assets, 1.9 billion. Current liabilities, 1.7 billion. So the current ratio is above one, that's good. They have 226 million of cash. Their customer accounts is 1.3 billion. 160 million of accounts receivables. They have a lot of intangibles and goodwill. That's over 3 billion of their assets. They do lots of acquisitions. They have 1.5 billion payable to customers. They have 2.5 billion of non current debt. This is debt due beyond one year. Here's a breakdown of the 2.5 billion of debt it's either in euros or US dollars. 900 million US dollars, it's a pretty high effective rate, 8.3%. 700 million in euros, the effective rate is 6.7%. Both of those are due in 2028. 445 million, that's a low rate, 3.2%. That's due in 2029. And 345 million, 4.2% due in 2029. So the debt isn't due for a number of years. So they have some breathing room. Let's go back to the balance sheet. This is the equity section, 3.2 billion of additional paid in capital. This is how much money they raised from issuing stock. An accumulated deficit, 2.2 billion. This is how much money they lost from running their business. So 877 million of equity. That's pretty close to their market cap. Let's look at their statement of cash flows. This is for the trailing nine months. Their operating cash flows were negative 355 million. Last year was positive 1.4 billion. A big reason it was positive was we added back this impairment of 1.9 billion. And the funds payable to customers, they had a positive 1.2 billion in 2022. It's a negative 530 million in 2023. I think this is a more of a timing thing. When funds are transacted, they need to receive cash and they owe cash. They talk about it here. The company has a corresponding liability to its customers recognized as funds payable and amounts due to customers. This represents timing differences in the settlement process between a cash settlement of a transaction and a recognition of the associated liability. So if you bought something on Amazon, the merchant provider you go through, it could be PayPal, it could be a credit card company. There's usually a one or two day delay between when you send the money and when the company who sells you the product receives the money. Let's go back to the statement of cash flows. That's why it makes it a little more complicated looking at a financial services company like this than a regular company, like a manufacturing company or a grocery store, for instance. These types of big money movements makes it hard to really understand how they're doing. So I guess you should probably ignore changes in working capital. Not totally ignore it, but for the purposes of understanding operating cash flow, maybe you should strip this all out because these are more timing delays, timing differences. Like for instance, accounts receivables, in one accounting period, you might sell a lot of product on credit. Say you sell a billion dollars of product on credit. So that means you gave away product and didn't receive anything for it. So you gave somebody a billion dollars of product and received nothing. So it would be a negative $1 billion in the statement of cash flow. So it will look like you lost a lot of cash. But then say you looked at the next accounting period, the next quarter, and say all your customers paid in that accounting period, paid the one billion. So you have an inflow of $1 billion. So it looked like you did great in your operating cash flow, but it's more of a timing thing, if that makes any sense. The stuff above here 
is actual cash movements that affect your business that are not a timing thing. Let's look at the investing section. They spent 12 million in PP&E. They purchased 27 million of merchant portfolios. That's from acquisitions. And they purchased 69 million of intangibles, also from acquisitions. Similar numbers last year, a little higher. In their financing section, they paid back 124 million of debt. They borrowed 90 million of debt and they repaid another 69 million of debt. It looks like they have a line of credit. It looks like they used 675 million and paid back 675 million. So maybe they needed money one quarter and paid it all back the following quarter. Let's take a look at their third quarter earnings slides. Here's a nice summary. Transaction volume of 35 billion, revenue close to 400 million. Both of those are up 8% year over year. Adjusted EBITDA 116 million. That gives them an EBITDA margin of 29%, up 3.2% or 320 basis points. Adjusted net income of 35 million and net leverage of 5.1x. A bit leverage, but lower than 2022 of 5.8x. When we looked at their financials earlier, we saw they had negative net income, but adjusted net income is positive because when you adjust the net income, you strip things out like stock-based compensation and other one-time items. This is the fifth consecutive quarter of reported year-over-year -year revenue growth. Merchant Solutions up 6%, Digital Wallets up 12%. LTM last 12 months free cash flow increased 39% year-over-year. They exceeded their 2023 target for net leverage. They think they'll lower it to 5.0x. They're reaffirming 2023 guidance. Another reason the stock price has come down is because their guidance, their projections, when they initially IPO'd, never really hit. They always came below expectation. And I think a big reason was because the world opened up again. People started leaving their house. COVID was settling down. And I think this company really benefited from people staying in their homes and playing games online or gambling online because that's how they make a lot of their money. They did announce a $50 million share repurchase program. And 50 million is a pretty big chunk of their market cap because their market cap is only like 700 million. Getting enterprise clients is key for this company because enterprise customers are big customers, a lot bigger than individuals like me and you. In Q3, they added 45 enterprise customers. That could really push up their volume and revenue, these customers. Even one big enterprise customer can double their revenue. Here are some of their Q3 deal highlights. Underdog Fantasy, Fanatic Sportsbook. They did a deal with Copa Airlines. That's a South American company. Some acquisitions in Europe, Leo Vegas, Revolut, and Pion. Here are their Q3 enterprise wins. 36% iGaming and video gaming, 33% FinTech services. Travel, leisure, and entertainment, 22%. That's from Copa. You can see how much activity there is in iGaming. DraftKings is probably one of the bigger ones. PokerStars, I used to play on that site all the time. That used to be so much fun playing on PokerStars. That was around 20 years ago when a big poker boom happened. When Chris Moneymaker won the World Series of Poker in 2003. I think he played in a $50 online tournament to win a seat. To the World Series of Poker. And a seed is $10,000. And then he ended up winning the tournament. I think he won $3 million maybe. In their digital wallets, their average transactions per user is going up. It was 2022 last year. Now it's 31. That's the number of transactions per user. Average revenue per user is also increasing from 72 to 91. Here are some Q3 financial highlights. Volume up 8%. 35 billion up from 32 and a half billion. Revenue up 8%, adjusted EBITDA up 22% to 116 million, free cash flow up 39% to 361 million, and adjusted net income up 21% to 35 million. This slide is their merchant solutions. The next slide is digital wallets. Those are their two big segments. So merchant solution is up 7%. The volume is almost 30 billion. Revenue 217 billion up 6%. Adjusted EBITDA up 26% to 57.5 million. Digital wallets, volume 5.6 billion up 18%. Revenue 183 billion up 12%. Adjusted EBITDA 80 million up 17%. This is the fifth consecutive quarter of credit card revenue growth year over year. Their revenue guidance for 2023 is 1.6 billion, which is about a 7% growth year over year. 
Adjusted EBITDA about 460 million. That's a growth of 12%. So you can see their numbers are improving slightly year over year, but their revenue isn't up that much the past few years. FYI, they're a SPAC. That means a shell company acquires them. It's like a reverse merger. To become public really quickly, a public shell company acquires a private company. They were a private company and they got acquired by a shell company, which made them public. And initially their guidance was much higher over the next few years when they initially became public, but they haven't really hit those numbers. They're not declining, which is good, but they're not hitting those numbers. And when you fall short of your guidance, there's a big sell-off because people get scared and think the company may go under. But there's still hope. They're still generating a decent amount of revenue. They're getting close to break even. This slide shows all the quarters in 2022 and three quarters in 2023. So their volume of merchant solutions was 26 billion in Q1 2022. Now it's 30 billion. It was higher in Q2 2023, a little over 30 billion. Digital wallets, it went from 5.4 billion. Now it's at its highest point ever, 5.6 billion. So not up that much. So total volume, 35 billion. It was higher last quarter, 35.5 billion. But I think those are the two highest quarters. And the take rate is their fee per transaction. So Immersion Solutions, their fee is 0.7% every quarter. They have a much higher fee for digital wallets, 32 to 3.4%. So the average take rate, the average fee they make per transaction is 1.1%. So their fee is 1.1% times the 35 billion. That gives them revenue of 396 million, down from last quarter, 402 million. Their gross profit is higher in digital wallets, 132 million. 100 million of merchant solutions. Their margins in merchant solutions is 46%. Digital wallets, 72%. So to calculate margin, it's gross profit, 132 million. Over revenue, 183 million. So really good margins in digital wallets. And they had the highest adjusted EBITDA this quarter, 116 million. Last quarter, their second highest, 113 million. Here's how they calculate adjusted EBITDA. You take your net loss of 2.5 million, then you add back the income taxes, 17 million. They add back interest expense, they add back depreciation, they add back stock-based compensation. So they get 116 million. So adjusted EBITDA margin of 29%. They are increasing their shares outstanding. It was 60.7 million, now it's 61.6 million. So they increased about 900,000 shares. And the way they calculate their free cash flow, they take their operating cash flow of negative 800 million minus CapEx, but they add back that 1 billion in movement in customer accounts because those are the timing differences between transactions. So they add them back. I mentioned that earlier when we look at a statement of cash flows. You could probably ignore these because they're mainly timing differences. So they calculate their free cash flow of 362 million. So when you make all these adjustments, the company looks great, right? Let's take a look at PaySafe on Yahoo Finance. So it looks like they started trading October 2020 and all SPACs start at $10. This does say $117 because they did a one for 12 reverse stock split. So you have to divide this number by 12 and that's what they're actually trading at on that day. And it went up right away. After three months, the stock was up a decent amount maybe up like 50%, but it's only been downhill since then. It just kept going down and down and down month after month. Then at the end of 2022, when they did the reverse stock split, it looks like it's fairly steady. It's not really going down too much. Maybe it's easier to look at the one year chart. Here's the reverse stock split. So it was trading probably around $1. And when they did the reverse split, they brought it up to $12. And then it nearly doubled after a couple of months. And then in June, 2023, it fell back to below $10. And it's kind of been up and down, up and down. So that would have been the best point to get it at below $10. But it's still trading like 80 plus percent below its IPO price. Here's their market cap by quarter since 930, 2022. It went from 1 billion down to 840 million, back to 1.05 billion. The lowest point was in mid 2023, 618 million. It is up since that point. Their enterprise value is also down from three and a half billion to three billion. Enterprise value is market cap plus net debt. Net debt is debt minus cash. 
Look how low their forward PE is getting, five. It looks like it's a really good value if you trust forward PE. Price to sales is also improving, 0.68 to 0.47. Price to book is below one. It was lower in September 2022, 0.69. And look at their enterprise value over EBITDA. It went from 32 to an obscene 7.6. Either it's an amazing value or they're going bankrupt. They have a beta of 1.79, so the stock moves a little less than two times the market. It's a bit volatile, down 2.5% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 24%. 52-week low is 9, the highest 24. And the stock is trading between its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About half a million shares are traded each day. It has a pretty low float. Of the 62 million shares outstanding, 35 million are on float. That means about 26 million shares are locked up. 24% held by insiders, those are locked up shares, 47% by institutions, and a short percentage isn't too high, 4 and 1 quarter percent. I guess the stock price has come down so much, people aren't willing to short it anymore. Let's take a look at Simply Wall Street. It's last price $12, $744 million market cap, up 7.5% in the past week, down 5.9% in the past year. Let's learn a little more about the company. They provide a payments platform for merchants and consumers in the entertainment sectors. They enable businesses and consumers to connect and transact seamlessly through capabilities in payment processing, digital wallet, and online cash solutions. They operate two segments, merchant solutions and digital wallets. Merchant Solutions offers PCI compliant payment acceptance and transaction processing solutions for merchants and integrated service providers, including merchant acquiring, transaction processing, gateway solutions, fraud and risk management tools, data and analytics, point of sale systems, and merchant financing solutions, as well as comprehensive support services. This segment provides its solutions under the PaySafe and Petroleum Card Services brands. The digital wallet segment offers digital wallet solutions under the Skrill, NetTeller, PaySafe Card, PaySafe Cash brands, and pay by bank solutions under the rapid transfer brand. It also provides e-cash solutions under the pay safe card and pay safe cash brands. Pay safe card prepaid MasterCard that can be linked to a digital pay safe card account and used to make purchases. Safety Pay, a platform that enables e-commerce transactions and Pago Effectivo, an alternative payment platform. Pago Effectivo is a Peruvian company they acquired. This company also acts as a payment processor. They just want to get more exposure in South America. And they're headquartered in the UK and London. Six analysts priced this stock at $14. They say the stock is undervalued. Simply Wall Street does not price this stock. In 2018, their revenue was $1.1 billion. It jumped up a lot in 2019 to $1.4 billion. Then it's been at $1.4 billion for a few years. It finally hit $1.5 billion by the end of 2022. Now it's getting close to 1.6 billion. And the forecast of 2024 is 1.7 billion, 2025, 1.84 billion. They do have a decent amount of debt on their books, 3.5 billion in 2018. Then in 2021, probably when they IPO, they paid down a lot of their debt. It came down to 2.1 billion. Now it's up a little bit to 2.5 billion. But you can see their equity is usually lower than their debt. Currently it's a lot lower. Their equity is 900 million, debt of 2.5 billion. And they do keep a little cash on their balance sheet. It's currently 226 million. There's been two insider sales in the past year. Kinney Holdings, they sold 1.5 million shares. The shell company that acquired PaySafe was Foley Trazamine Acquisition Corp. The CEO of Kinney Holdings is William Foley. 29% of the company is held by institutions, 29% by the general public, 21% by private companies. 18% by VC and private equity firms, and 3% by individuals. Their biggest shareholder is Pi Holdings, 21% of the company they own. Then Blackstone, 17.7%. Blackstone is a pretty big investment bank. They do a lot of private equity investing. I'm not too sure when Blackstone invested in them. It may have been before they became a SPAC or after. I can't find much information on Pi Holdings. Let me know in the comments if you know what this is. There's Kinney Holdings. They still own 3%. BlackRock, William Foley. He's a CEO of Kinney Holdings. Vanguard is bottom on the list, 0.22%. Their employee count is pretty steady, 3,200. 
and currently 3300 and the ticker only trades in one place on the New York Stock Exchange. So let me know what you think, give the video a like, subscribe or comment below if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.